very young trooper in the Biafran Army. How old are you? I'm 10 years. 10 years old. Do you know why Biafra is fighting? Biafra is fighting for survivors. Is it going to win? Yes, it will. If civil war comes, and I do think it calls for freedom. I, this is the high respect I have for Ojuku. Because if, you go, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to sit there, sit here and die. If our people are going to die, we're not going to just sit there and die. Let's go and die in Lagos. So he was coming to Lagos. So, and my name is Nekme Obasoge. I'm broadcasting from Toronto, Canada. Our program of the day is based on the history of the Nigerian Civil War, also known as Biafran War. It is once said that history helps us to develop a better understanding of the world. So I'm here to do a brief analysis of the history of Nigeria from 1960 to the end of the Civil War in 1970. The political and tribal conflicts that ravaged the country during this period. Yeah, we can take it from the time of independence when um, Azikwe was sworn in as the president of Nigeria and uh, Amadou Bello was the premier of the north and uh, our uh, Kintola and our uh, Nawula were, they were struggling with, 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 with the premiership of the of the west and then Okwara was the premier of the of the east and uh, Tafa Balewa was the prime minister of Nigeria at the time but there was a, at a certain time there started problem in the west when Nigeria gained its independence from the British colonial rule in 1960, the country was divided into three provinces. It was actually formed along tribal lines. The Hausas and Fulanis in the north, Yorubas in the southwest, and Igbos in the southeast. In 1963, Abubakar Tafawa Baliwa became the Prime Minister and Unandi Azikwe was the President, followed by other political leaders. However, a few years after the creation of Nigeria, tribal tensions increased in the country as a result of a military coup that was organized by five majors. The civil war that started in 1967 and ended in 1970 was actually rooted in the tribal and political crisis that commenced after Nigeria gained its independence from the colonial rule. In January 15, 1966, Five majors in the Nigeria army, one Yoruba and four Igbo majors, organized a bloody coup. In the morning of the coup day, Major Kaduna Unzuogu, who was the military leader of the coup, with his troops took over the house of the leader of the northern region. Unzuogu opened fire and killed Armadou Bello by himself. The Prime Minister of Nigeria, Abu Bakar Tafawa Baliwa was killed in his mansion in Lagos. His body was discovered six days later. The premier of the western region, Chief Samuel Akintola, was also killed. Total of 11 Nigerian politicians, two soldiers were killed and three others kidnapped. They attacked the cities of Lagos, Ibadan and Kaduna. Major Umzuogu's colleague, General John C. Aguiranzi from the Igbo ethnic group, took over the government, which ended Nigeria's democracy. Aguiranzi became the first military head of state of Nigeria. At a certain time, there started problem in the West. Anytime there is problem in the West, there is problem in the whole of Nigeria at that time. Because the West was the, about the central nerve of Nigerian politics at that time. So when there was problem in the West, the, there was problem all over Nigeria. So the, some army officers in the Nigerian army, they took it upon themselves that, uh, okay, these politicians, they just corrupt. That's why we're having all this problem all over Nigeria. So it is time to get rid of these politicians so we can cleanse up the system of running Nigeria. But unfortunately, the army officers that organized the coup, they 
had a plan to get rid of the but the senior, the most prominent politicians in Nigeria at that time, but somehow the army officers, eighty percent of them were Igbo people, Igbo guys in the military, and only one or two of them were not Igbo. And then, whether by intention or by mistake, when they carried out the coup. On January 15, 1966, they killed some politicians, prominent politicians. They killed Akintola in the west, and they killed Saddam Sokoto and Tafa Balewa in the north. And uh, they didn't kill Awolo because Awolo was already in prison at that time. So when he said that they didn't know exactly which prison Awolo was, or they didn't have the intention of killing Awolo, or because Awolo was in prison, it was protected under the federal security. They didn't kill Awolo. But somehow, they omitted Igbo political leaders. The majority of you killers or the soldiers that carried out the coup were Igbo people. And the majority of the people that you did not kill were Igbo people. So definitely to prove to the whole world or to any Nigerian or any other any other people from other parts of Nigeria that you did not intentionally do it will be very difficult. Azikwe was not killed. Opara was not killed. K. Ombadiwe was a very, very prominent politician at that, as young as I was that time. The name of K. Ombadiwe was in our mouth. You see, the name of K. Ombadiwe, Okotiebo. Awolo wa Akintola Tafabale wa Sadano Sokoto and Azikwe. Those are the people that we were all shouting about in politics at that time. So if you were going to kill Tafabale wa and Sadano Sokoto and you will kill Akintola and maybe you targeted Awolo wa, you didn't get him or you did not, I don't know about that, but you did not kill anyone from the Igbo area, then there will be a problem. Because majority of these army officers, they were Igbos. So I believe this mentality was what precipitated the civil war. So, by the, the, the coup took place, and Aguirosi was able to take control and become the head of state. And Aguirosi, unfortunately, Aguirosi too was an evil, evil man. But then, educated mind will understand that Aguirosi was the most senior army officer at that time. So, he automatically, if the military were going to take over, he was the one to take over. So, he took over. For me today, I don't think it's because he was Igbo or he was not Igbo. He was the most senior military officer. But the mentality of the, the people at that time would not think like that for sure. The 1966 school exacerbated tribal tension in the country during that period because majority of the soldiers that carried out the coup were from the Igbo race. And majority of the politicians that were not killed we are from the Igbo race as well. Unadi Azikiwe, who was the president of Nigeria at that time, he was not killed, he fled the country. Michael Opara, who was the premier of the eastern region, was not killed. Majority of Nigerians at that time believed that the coup was motivated by tribal discrimination in the country. That is what led to the persecution of the Igbo people, especially in the northern part of the country. The five measures justified the coup on their quest to eradicate corrupt politicians. They claim that Nigerian ministers are living exorbitant lifestyles and spending public funds at the expense of citizens. General Kaduna Unzuagu, who was the military leader of the coup, says that we wanted to get rid of rotting and corrupt ministers. We wanted to go down the big wings in our way. It was uncertain if tribal discrimination was embedded in the first coup that led to the persecution and marginalization of the Igbo people. The aim of the coup was to eradicate corrupt politicians in the country during that period. Six months after the first coup, the northern Nigerian soldiers arranged a bloody coup against Abu Iransi. He was killed by the northerners, and General Yakubu Gowan took over power as the military head of state. 
The coup also led to the killings of many Igbos in the northern part of the country. Kaduna Unzogu, who was the mastermind of the 1966 coup, justified their action on the corruption that was existing among Nigerian politicians during that period. I'm going to play a video of him describing how they carried out the coup in January 15, 1966. Just listen to this. The himself attempt to fight. Well, no, we didn't see him until the time we actually shot him. He ran away from his house and we fired the first few shots of anti tank gun into the building. The whole roof was blown up and the place was set alight. Then we went to the rear of the house and started searching from room to room until we found him amongst the women and children hiding himself. So we sort of took, her, took away the women and children and uh, uh, took him. Kaduna Uzoabu depicts how they killed the northern leaders with confidence. However, after the coup, he was arrested and jailed in Lagos. Later, he was transferred to the eastern region of the country. Just few months after the first coup, the Northerners also organized the second coup that led to the death of Agu Ironsi. Yakubu Gowan, who is from the northern region, captured power and became the second military head of state of Nigeria. At that time, Gowan was about the most senior at that time after Agurosi was gone. So they brought an in, in, a northerner. Gowan and Ojuku at that time, they were both left hand corners. They were friends. We understand they used to be roommates. They used to be uh, street mates too. You know, they used to drink together, chill together. They were good friends. But then they were the spa in the military. They were both left hand corners at that time. But these were northern boys that carried out the coup. From our understanding, Ojuku did not know anything about the first coup. So when Gowon took over in, on July 29, Ojuku was made the governor of the eastern region, and Nasan Kasina the governor of the northern region, and Fajui was made, I mean, Adeyinka Adebayo was made the governor of the western region. So Gowon became the head of state in Northern. Put in power by a coup that were carried out by northern elements in the military. It was under the administration of Yakubu Gowan that Oduku was the premier of the eastern region. They were friends. But the incessant killings of the Igbo people did not stop. Oduku described it as genocide against the Igbos. Actually, the Biafran problem was nothing except being genocidal. There was no distinction. The mere fact that you were an Easterner in those days labeled you fit only for one thing, death, and death at the hands of the Nigerian authorities. The Igbos and their associates were killed in practically every village in northern Nigeria. They were killed in many places in western Nigeria. They were even on Carter Bridge, the very center of Lagos, people were looked at and they thought, oh, this looked an Igbo and killed. General Yakubu Bowan and Oduku went to Ghana for a peace talk, also known as Aburi Accord. Accra, Ghana was chosen as a venue because Oduku's safety could not be guaranteed anywhere within the western or northern part of the country. Agreement was reached in Ghana and Yakubu Gowan promised to implement the Aburi principles as soon as possible. So they started to hit on the Igbo guys wherever they found them in the north, even up to the middle bed and everywhere. They were killing them, they were beating them up, they were lynching them, and many of them they were they began to go to the east and to go to their to where we call Biafra today, they used to, they were going there. And then there was problem between Ojuku and Gowon and the other army officers at the ruling party, I mean the ruling uh, Kakos. So they were discussing how to end this killing of the Igbo people. They even went to Ghana under the Ghanaian president at that time to resolve the issue. This is what we call the Aburi Agreement. So they reached an agreement that this thing will stop. 
But then Ojuku claimed that when they came back from Aburi, Gowon was supposed to have stopped the killing and the lynching of the Igbo people within a certain period of time. And Ojuku claimed in his book, because I'm involved, that he knew Gowon very well. It's like knowing my friend too. I know my friend's skill. I know how he makes decisions. I know what he, what he's capable of doing. So knowing Gowon, Ojuku believed that Gowon, if Gowon choose to end the killing within a certain period, Gowon was capable of doing it. Gowon, he believed Gowon has the capacity to control the military to stop this thing. But because he didn't stop, then Ojuku came for war. And <laughs> I don't, I, this is the high respect I have for Ojuku. Because he figured, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to sit there, sit here and die. If our people are going to die, we're not going to just sit there and die. Let's go and die in Lagos. So he was coming to Lagos, and that was the seat of power. We know we're going to die. We know you're going to kill us, but kill us in Lagos, not here on our land, where they, they blocked him at Ore, and they, 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 they sent him back. That's how this, I believe the civil war started. On the 30th of May, 1967, Biafra declared secession from Nigeria. This was exacerbated by the incessant killings of Igbos in northern Nigeria and the refusal of the military head of state, General Yakubu Gowan, to mobilize security agents to stop the killings. As the country was preparing for the civil war, Ojuku, who was also a military man, understood the nitty-gritty of the Nigerian army. He was very optimistic about the readiness of the Biafras. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. Kaduna Unzogu was released from prison by Ojuku and asked to join the battle on the side of the Biafrans. On the 29th of July 1967, Unzogu, who had been promoted to the rank of a Biafran lieutenant colonel, was trapped in an ambush near Unzuka while conducting a night operation against federal troops. He was killed during the operation and his corpse was identified immediately. After the defeat of Biafra and the end of the civil war, orders were given by the head of state, General Yakubu Gowan, for him to be buried at the military cemetery in Kaduna with full military honors. Even in death, Unzuwagu was still respected by the federal and northern troops. He was referred to as a warrior nice, charismatic, and disciplined officer, highly admired and respected by his colleagues. The declaration of secession by the Biafrans was against the one Nigeria principle of the country. The controversy led to the civil war. During the war, the sign that says, to keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done, was posted all over the country. The constitution says no secession. So if anybody was going to secede, then we have to bring that person back. And the slogan at that time is, keep Nigerian one. That was the one slogan at that time. And in the mouth of every one of us in primary school or wherever, it was keep Nigeria one. To keep Nigeria one is a task for everyone. When the war finally broke out, some international institutions were tricky. Russia and the Britain were supplying ammunition to the federal government, but the U.S. was in the side of the Biafrans. The rate of casualties in Biafra land increased as Nigerian planes continued to drop bombs in public spaces, such as schools, markets, and hospitals. A time ago, a Nigerian jet dropped a bomb nearby. What targets are they attacking? Are they attacking military targets or are they attacking defenseless civilians? Now for the bomb, you've seen it here. There's a shrapnel from it. Normally, the Nigerians attack civilians in marketplaces. Normally, they bomb hospitals. 
Indeed, this last one, the aim was quite clear. It was a missionary hospital. A lot of international countries supported Nigeria, and many supported the Biafra Republic. Particularly, America was supporting Biafra Republic, while British stuck to Nigeria. Maybe because we got our independence from uh, from Britain, and Britain had commitment to Nigeria, and Britain helped us to draw our constitution and whatever. And the constitution, according to record, according to our history, is that there will not be any secession. Impressive. Most military observers credit what success the Nigerian army has had so far, chiefly to their lopsided superiority in firepower furnished by the British and the Russians. It is said only half in jest. The Nigerian army has so much firepower that they use ammunition as a defoliant. Nigeria's planes, MiG-17s and Aleutian bombers, were bought for cash from the Russians who want to get a political foothold here. After many months of fighting helpless war, Nigeria then blocked food and other supplies from entering the newly formed Republic of Biafra which resulted in a humanitarian crisis and hunger among civilians. We're fighting our own brothers, our own friends, our own probably colleagues that in fact we were trained together. Now, I accept them as my people. I don't call them enemies. They're not my enemies. That's why in fact we don't use the word enemy. We use the word only rebels against in Ojuku and his clique and those in fact men that fight for him. But not against all the Igbos. While the relief flights have reduced dramatically the number of children and adults starving to death, down perhaps to 600 a week from the high of several thousand a week last year, the dying continues. When the heat of the war continued to devastate the Biafrans, Ujuku fled the country and left innocent civilians to sort for themselves. Oh, but he, well, he ended up in Ivory Coast. He didn't take three days before we started knowing, oh, Ujuku is in Ivory Coast, Ujuku is in Ivory Coast. And then the, the Biafran army, the high level officers, they surrendered to, and, uh, to Obasanjo. Obasanjo was the commander of the third marine commando at that time. So he was the one that received, uh, he accepted the surrender. Oh. Yeah. He was the one that uh, handed over the paper of the end of the war, the documents of the end of the war to go on. But we have Colonel Obasanjo, who is the commander of three marine commando, who have been able to capture a number of senior secessionist officers, and he had brought them to Lagos to see us in order to let us have the acceptance of the spirit of one Nigeria. To formally give up secession and report for the appointment and redeployment. Felicitation. Your Excellency. Oh. Glad to see you again. My pleasure. How are you? Very well, thank you. Glad to see you again. Thank you. Patrick Amadi. Mm. How are you? Excellency. Glad to see you again. Thank you very much. Glad to see you again. It's an Welcome experience. Home. Honestly. Glad to see you again. And I would like, therefore, to take this opportunity to say that I, Major General Philip Ephium, officer administering the government of the Republic of Biafra, now wish to make the following declaration. That we affirm we are loyal Nigerian citizens and accept the authority of the Federal Military Government of Nigeria. That we accept the existing administrative and political structure of the Federation of Nigeria, that any future constitutional arrangement will be worked out by representatives of the people of Nigeria, that the Republic of Biafra hereby ceases to exist. The conflict 
that accumulated and later led to the civil war started after the first coup. Ojuku did not participate in the first coup, but he was the premier of the eastern region under the administration of Yakubo Gowa. Ojuku played the role of a leader because the only way he could protect the Igbo people from persecution in the country at that time was to negotiate with the federal government. That is what led him and Yakubu Gowan to visit Ghana for a peace talk, also known as Aburi Accord. But when they came back to Nigeria, Gowan failed to implement the principles entrenched in the accord. Ojuku reacted by creating the Republic of Biafra and declared secession from Nigeria because he believes that the only way he could protect the Igbo people at that time was to separate from Nigeria. More than one million civilians, including children and women, lost their lives in the war. The graphic images of the dead and suffering Biafrans went viral in the global world via media attracting international relief efforts. The food crisis led Biafrans to surrender on January 13, 1970. However, a lot of damages have been done to humanity and the country as a whole. The war claimed the lives of millions of Nigerians and led to the destruction of properties and infrastructures in the country. The horror amounted by the civil war is unimaginable. Ojuku, who was the architect of the war, regretted the essence of the Afra war. Ojuku led the Biafrans against the government in the last war. He says it would be a mistake for anyone to provoke another. So a lot of people will say, but you were leading the first one. Yes, I led the first one. And I will say to everyone, I led proudly the first one. I don't think a second one is necessary. We should have learned from that first one. In 2011, Ojuku passed away peacefully in London. He was indeed a hero and will forever be remembered 